Um, okay, we'll, we'll get started. Um, all right, um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, my name is Sam Yusuf. I will be uh, speaking with Anna today. Um, before we start, I just want to sort of lay out sort of the ground rules, the format here. Um, so because this is behind the CV, um, mostly Anna and I are going to be talking about things that are not visible on her CV. Um, so I'll just summarize very briefly her CV at the beginning. Um, and then I'll get us started uh, asking some questions and Anna will tell us about herself. Um, one of the cool things about this format is that the audience is welcome to ask questions if they wish. So if you have a burning question, you can raise your hand and we'll try to call on you. Um, but if not, we'll also save some time at the end for, for audience questions if you wish. Um, any questions about the format or anything like this? Cool. We're expecting it to take about, you know, I'll ask questions for like 40, 45 minutes and then we'll leave time for questions and we'll wrap up within about an hour. Cool. Great. Um, okay. So um, with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anna Shapiro. Um, Anna received her BS in Symbolic Systems with a focus in Neuroscience uh, from Stanford University. Um, after which she went on to receive a PhD in Psychology and Neuroscience uh, from Princeton, where she was co-advised by Ken Norman, Nick Turk Brown, and Matt Botvinnik. Um, then following a postdoc at the Center for Sleep and Cognition in the Harvard Medical School, she began as an assistant professor here at Penn in the Department of Psychology in 2019. Um, in her short but distinguished career, she has won countless awards for both teaching and research, including the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science, and more recently, the Young Investigator Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society. Um, and I must say, as someone who works in a different subfield of cognitive science from Anna, I cannot think of anyone who I hear mentioned so frequently and so positively by so many of my colleagues. Uh, her work has become a really foundational part of how we understand sort of the cognitive and neural systems that support human memory. So with that, join me in welcoming Anna Shapiro. Um, so I'd like to start off with a really simple question, which is, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, yeah, originally I wanted to do physics. Um, so I think a lot of people take this kind of trajectory, but I like um, I wanted to study whatever was the most important thing in the universe. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, that must be physics. Like, what is the universe made out of? And I was reading like books about quantum mechanics and trying to think about like entanglement it like just felt like the, the string theory the mysteries of the universe and i thought that that was what i wanted to do um so that was like high school maybe even middle school i, I sometimes tell the story about um i uh had like my parents had got me a, a subscription to teen magazine in middle school and i was like not interested in it and my my um sixth grade science teacher told me there was this magazine called Scientific American. I like went home and I asked my mom if I could have a subscription to Scientific American. And she was like, um, sh sure, yeah. Like I was just this strange, like anomalous child. Um, so yeah, so I swapped out my subscription and like started reading about uh, physics. Um, and that's what I thought I wanted to do um, for most of high school. And I didn't even take, we, my high school had a neuroscience class. I didn't even take it. Um, I, that wasn't that wasn't my interest, um, but then I actually took AP Psychology in my in my senior year, and um, and then I got very interested in um, in psychology. I also read Gerald Usher Bach, which I highly recommend if people um, don't know that book, which got me really interested in the mind and the mind as a computer, and um, and then I and like I was interested in philosophy of mind and consciousness, and then I decided we don't even understand like ourselves and how we can perceive the universe like that's the first we have to like that's the most important fundamental question and so um so i like switched over from from six to to psychology so so that was what i was like by by then like before i applied to college i was pretty set on like psychology maybe philosophy of mind maybe thinking about the brain as a computer and that was why i went to that some lock systems program at Stanford. so i want to ask about that program so what is that exactly? That's an unfamiliar yeah. major on most campuses. Yeah. Is it something? Is it a common major? And, and is it how much of it is computer science? How much of it is psychology? Yeah, it's a um, so I, you can think of it as a cognitive science major with a heavy computer science focus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been other other majors at school at other schools that have been modeled from the Symbolic Systems major, and it's they call it cognitive science. Um, so yeah, um, it is. It's kind of equal parts computer science, philosophy, linguistics, and psychology. And um, 
you can focus in certain areas that you're more excited about. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I was I was very interested in the like in the philosophy of mind aspect of it. Oh, there's also a lot of like logic and that kind of thing. So it's it's like it's it was originally um, very much thinking about the brain as a symbolic processing system, right? Um, and so like it's yeah, so it had a certain kind of bent of like thinking about the brain as like a computer, like more literally than I might think of it um, now, but. Um, yeah, that was the major. I was super excited about it. Yeah. How did you get involved in research and how did you start to find your research niche to the extent that you have such a thing? Yeah. Um, okay, so the summer after, I guess this, okay, the summer before I went to college, I worked in a, um, in like a mouse wet lab that was doing, um, um, it was like a multiple sclerosis mo mouse model, and uh, and it was a lot of like pipetting and like slicing up mouse brains and stuff. And I just like I didn't really like wet lab work, so I I it was useful for me to just learn that. And I was like, okay, I think this isn't you know this isn't the kind of thing um, that I want to do next. And um, I wanted to be in like a place with like computers and I don't know. I didn't want to slice up mouse brains. Yeah. Um, so then the summer after my freshman year of college, I like went back home to Boston um, and, uh, and worked in a couple labs at MIT. So I worked partly with, um, in Josh Tenenbaum's lab mostly with Noah Goodman and Pat Shafto, um, and also Ted Gibson's lab with Ev, Ev Federico. Um, and that was awesome. Um, but I also realized I didn't like that either. So I, so I was, do, I was really I wanted to learn about models and I was like building Bayesian models and um, in with, with no good men and I just like I thought it was all very interesting but I it wasn't um, it wasn't like satisfying to me in the way in the sense that like I, I felt like the uh, um, the models weren't engaging with the like a level of representation and mechanism that I was interested in thinking about in the brain um, and so I thought like okay that was really interesting but also not exactly what I'm looking for um, and then that year so when I went back for my sophomore year that was the year that Jay Mulholland moved from um, CMU to Stanford and I heard people talking about oh Jay McCollum is coming um, and I was like oh who's, who's Jay McCollum and I was looking up um, and, and learning about what neural network models were and um, and I was like, this seems like the kind of thing I'm looking for. So it was like neural network models were a way of kind of thinking about the brain in these like computational terms, not that as a computer exactly, depending on what you mean by computer, but um, but like a way of actually thinking about um, the mechanisms of learning and the brain and representation, how that gives rise to interesting different um, cognitive phenomena. And that felt like the kind of thing that I could sink my teeth into that I was going to get excited about. So I joined his lab um, and I was doing research in his lab like during the year and over the summers. Um, so I, I was like, I spent a lot of time there and got to do a, a few different projects um, with him and that was like really, that was my thing. So the very first project actually was in an area that it was like the right kind of modeling but I, st I realized it wasn't exactly the area I wanted to work in so uh, we were doing a model of um, building a model of the balance scale task which is like a developmental um, task where uh, you track like the way the kids make judgments about which side of the balance scale will fall depending on how many things are placed at which distances from the fulcrum. Um, and there had been a debate in the literature about um, whether connectionist style models could explain like quick developmental transitions that mm -hmm. happen in this task. Um, and so we, we like responded to that kind of um, debate showing that a connectionist model could indeed show the kind of like just stage like discrete kind of transition that um, that people thought couldn't be done with that model. So I, I was like really excited about that that like debate and like using a model to show something you know sh like move that forward that like our understanding of what's like possible and what the mechanisms are there. So that was all really great. But I still wasn't that excited about the question the the like the developmental question in particular about the like physics of the balance scale task. I, just an aesthetic thing, there's nothing wrong with it. I just like wasn't that excited about it. And then I heard about other things happening in the lab 
around this complementary learning system theory, which I'm still so obsessed with. My lab will like laugh. It's like all I talk about. So, I, so I kind of once I heard about that, I just like locked into that, and I've never let go. So, so I got really excited about um, this idea that there are these two different learning systems um, that have different functions, and it just felt like it could explain so much about human memory and if and memory and learning are a really natural domain to use these style of models that are really fundamentally learning models and representational models and so um, so I just got very excited about that like learning and memory domain um, while I was still in Jay's lab and then I kind of like continued on that trajectory. So it seems like from that point on there's a very clear trajectory to now in terms yeah. of your research interest but um, even so what was it like thinking about going to grad school, I assume that was clear to you at that time that you wanted to do that, but how did you decide to do that? How did you decide where to go to graduate school? Yeah, um, yeah, I remember, um, I didn't know like from the beginning of undergrad that you could, like what this, what academia was and what the steps were and PhDs, like I didn't know about any of that. Um, I was just interested in the questions and these professors who were saying interesting things in classes and so I so getting involved in research I I don't remember at what point I, I kind of have a memory of like asking people around Jay's lab like so who like what's what are the steps you do what and then what what's a postdoc and then and then you can be a professor I just like so I, people had to explain that to me and I was like okay okay so if I wanted to keep doing this kind of thing I could like apply to grad school and so I was like okay I think, I guess, yeah, I love this, so I guess that's what I do, like, apply to grad school. So, um, yeah, so I didn't really consider other things, and I, and I also remember in my senior year, people were saying, oh, if you want to do something else, like, now's the time, you know, travel the world or try out a, some other thing, because once you go to grad school, you're kind of locked into that for five years, and, um, and I was like, I don't, I don't, I can't think of, I'm so dorky. Ugh. I, I I just can't think of something I'm more excited about. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna apply to grad school. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did. Um, and I I had done like you know I had done a bunch of modeling. I had done some behavioral experiments, but I really wanted to learn fMRI or like some some kind of um, like way of measuring the brain um, in grad school. And so I, I I applied to places where I could do some fMRI, um, but there were still people around. Um, who were doing the style of neural network modeling because mm -hmm. um, I had decided like that was the style of modeling I was excited about and so I wanted to, to mm -hmm. find a place where I could do that. Mm -hmm. And then once you got to grad school, I think it's unusual for one to have a trio of advisors. That's not, yeah. that's not very common. Um, was that something that was formed immediately? Was that something you developed over years? How did you, just more generally, like how did you figure out your place in graduate school and who you were going to work with and what you were going to work on and so forth? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting um, thing that happened. Okay, so so I originally applied to work with Ken Norman, and he um, and he said, you know, come, like you seem great, you know, come and interview, but um, I don't do neural network modeling anymore. And I was like, huh, okay, all right, well, that's too bad. Um, so I like show up for, well I, I think at that point then I ca contacted Matt Bob and I, Nick had not up, come to Princeton at that point yet. Um, and I wrote to Matt and I was like, hey I want to do neural network modeling, like what do you think, would this be a potentially good fit? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, like come, come interview. And so, um, so I, so he was, uh, so he ended up being like the person who's, you know, I applied to his lab and he, and I came in with him as my primary mentor. Um, and then I like came to Princeton and I showed up and like my first meeting with Matt, he was like, okay, cool. So we're going to build a Bayesian model of this thing. I was like, no, blah, 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 blah. like I know, like I want to do neural network modeling. And he was like, that's very specific. Like, how do you know exactly? And I was like, well, I don't, I tried different things. and like, I really want to do this. And, um, he was like, well, we're not really doing that anymore. And so, um, so I was like, okay. So we, so we came up with this plan to, um, by the way, Matt is now the head of the neuroscience unit at DeepMind, so like we got back, we got we got back got back to it, but it was a time where it wasn't that cool to do neural network modeling. Um, so I um, so we came up with a plan for my first year where I was gonna like run this task, but then like build a bunch of different models, different styles of models, and compare them, and and including a neural network model. So we came up with this like compromise plan. 
Um, and that I think that that went fine. And like our first paper together, we like neural network model was the best explanation. That was the one that we included in our paper. Um, and then I. Um, and then Ken sort of, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I don't know if he was starting to already come back around in his own work or what happened, but at some point he was he was like interested again in neural network mm -hmm. modeling. And I was like, I'm still interested, like let's do it. And so then and so then I start and then I like started a project in his lab. And his lab really was more aligned with my interest in learning and memory than Matt's lab was. So I was doing like basic learning work in Matt's lab, but he, that wasn't the focus of his lab. So, um, so it was like, it was great to work with him, but it wasn't, uh, like I was a, my interests were a better fit for Ken's lab. Um, so yeah, so Ken ended up being kind of more like acting as my primary advisor. Um, Nick arrived at Princeton with the same year that I arrived and we just were like, his office was across the hall from mine and we came up with a project idea together and started running it and then, you know, and then I ended up working with him on, on multiple projects. So that was just a kind of like happy coincidence that wasn't planned. And then I, and then when I was getting my my thesis, it felt weird for him to not be like an official advisor because I'd worked so much with him. So so we had so we like decided that Matt and Ken were my co primary advisors and Nick was my official secondary advisor. So that was how we like put it all together. And one thing I'm always curious about is sort of that initial stage of graduate school, or at least to me, it felt like I was having to like figure out who I was, like my identity and so forth. And it seems like you had a pretty clear idea of what you wanted to do. You, you showed up at Princeton and convinced all these other people to study uh, what you wanted to study. Um, but was there ever a point where you were kind of asking yourself, like, uh, what kind of career you wanted to have? Like, what kind of lab you wanted to have? Or, or you know, um, uh, to what extent you wanted to be a neuroscientist versus someone who focused on these models or anything like that? Did, or was it was it more straightforward for you exactly what you wanted to do? I think like methods wise it was pretty straightforward in the sense that like I wanted to continue to use this style of modeling that I was really excited about and I um, and I wanted to learn fMRI and I got to do those things and kind of combine them and and so that that like worked out and kind of like continued on. I mean, we can talk about postdoc later where I decided to do sleep, you know, sleep EEG stuff. That was like a different direction. But um, yeah, I think that, so methodol methodologically it was kind of straightforward. The questions were actually, that took me longer to um, figure out than it might look from the outside. Like, I mean, the way I just told the story was like, I got obsessed with complementary learning systems and then forevermore I just studied complementary learning systems. But actually like, um, the projects I was doing in the three different labs were see, appeared kind of unrelated, which is weird because looking back, there I have a story that fits it all together. But at the time, it was kind of um, it was not clear what that story was. So um, I had been doing I, so my project with Nick was to look at the role of the medial temporal lobe in statistical learning. My project with Matt was to look at like event segmentation with these like complicated graph uh, structures. And our first paper, the first paper with Matt, we didn't even run an ROI looking at the hippocampus, which is like really embarrassing looking back because I was at the same time running this other study on the role of the hippocampus in a kind of learning that's kind of similar. Um, and I just didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that I should check what the hippocampus was doing in that, that paper with Matt. So then like I was presenting at a conference uh, the, the paper with Matt and somebody in the memory field came up to me because they knew me from my work with Nick and they were like, so what's the hippocampus doing? And I was like, oh, um, yeah, I guess I should check that. So then I went back and like ran the ROI. It turned out the hippocampus was also involved in that task. So we like wrote another paper about what the hippocampus was doing in that task. And then I was like, okay, okay. Actually, like something, so, so that's so interesting that the hippocampus is doing both of those things. And what does that mean? And how do we think about that? So it was like, I was like, it felt like I was just stumbling around to happen to all kind of fit together later into a story. And then by the end of grad school, I was starting to work on this, this model of um, like, how do we think about the role of the hippocampus in these different kinds of learning and, um, and that like really like tied things together and has become a, a motivation for a lot of the things I've done since then, a lot of things that the lab is up to. So um, it, yeah, it felt kind of, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Throughout those 
years, so late undergrad, early grad school, do you think there were any like inflection points where like if this conversation had gone slightly differently, you could have studied this totally different thing, or do you think you would have found your way uh, to this kind of thing that you study now one way or another? I mean, I think there's I think there's a lot of randomness in the in the process, but like so for example, what if that hippocampus ROI hadn't have worked out? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just would have sent me in such a different direction. Um, I don't even know. Maybe I'd be studying like event segmentation, or I, I don't know something like I would have sort of followed it up in a different way, um, and not got you know not come to that model, and then yeah. And then there's also so I guess maybe we'll get to this in a minute, but like I. I was not thinking about sleep for most of my grad time, and, and Ken had this grant on sleep, and he needed somebody to, to like work on the grant, and so he was trying to convince me to get interested in sleep, and I was very resistant to it, but he like wore me down and got me interested in sleep, so that was also sort of like, it didn't have to go that way. That was because he had this grant, and like he actually had to convince me <laughs> that it was, sleep felt very like random, and, um, and yeah, so right now half of the lab is doing sleep stuff. It ha it it feels like it didn't have to go that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I'll ask about that. Yeah. So how did that change? Like, was there something that clicked for you where you thought that sleep would be a useful tool, or was it sort of a practical choice? How did that come to be? Um, yeah. So so Ken convinced me that um, there was something really key about the process during sleep for understanding how we build up our memories over time. And we weren't, like, if, if my goal is to understand how do we build up our, like, understanding of the world, our representation of the world over experiences, you're just going to miss a big part of the picture um, if you are, if you're not studying the consolidation process. And sleep seems to be doing something really important for that consolidation process. Um, so I, um, so I, so I just like I, I was convinced by that argument and like started reading papers um, about sleep and and maybe like part of you know part of the complementary learning story system story might actually have to do with sleep, and then um, and then so Ken and I started to build this model of sleep, which um, has taken is Derek yeah Derek is over there so it would taken. So Darriot took it over, and then we finally just published it last year. So, but the very beginnings of that um, model um, were happening at the end of grad school, and then so I so I got excited about it by the end of grad school, and then I was like, okay, but I don't know how to run a sleep experiment. So I, I'd like if I'm going to if I'm if I want sleep to be a part of my lab and theories about sleep, like I'd like to be able to run my own sleep experiments as opposed to, you know, build models and then convince somebody else to run experiments or hope that somebody else runs the interesting experiments, right? So that that's one of the themes of like of my um, like academic trajectory is that I like I I always I wanted to be in in I wanted to go to grad school in a place where I could see that model of like doing um, empirical work alongside computational work, kind of in the same lab, as opposed to working like having a theorist and then an, an, uh, uh, like experimentalist. Um, I felt like it's really powerful to be able to do both, and you can test your own theories and kind of move things forward um, with more control over the process. So, so that was why I went to um, do a postdoc in a sleep lab, so I could, yeah. This is just a brief scientific tangent. But um, I'm persuaded by that argument that sleep is this really fundamental thing, especially if you study learning and memory. Yet it seems to me to be like one of the most greatly understudied things in our field. Like every department has someone or two people or three people who study like perception and stuff. Yeah. But there's a handful of people studying sleep. Why is that? Like, why does this seem like such an understudied thing? Is it just difficult? Do we just not know where to start? What's the challenge there? That's interesting. It doesn't seem that understudied to me, but it's true that. Uh, it's true that there are like that many departments don't have sleep people, but there are some departments that have a lot of sleep people. So I don't know why it's like clustered in that way. Mm -hmm. It's actually a lot of sleep and consolidation research is happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like huge groups in Germany and in England, and um, and I don't know what the like sociology of that is, um, but like I, it doesn't 
in terms of the amount of literature and the number of papers being produced, it doesn't seem small to me, but it is true that it's like possible. Yeah, I think, well, especially within yeah. like cognitive science specifically. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know the last time or if I've ever seen just a, a sleep paper that's talking about memory in a purely cognitive way. And that strikes me as a bit yeah. funny. It's not just yeah. neuroscience that's interested in that. But. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, like, it's harder to study, right? Because you have to like track people over time and maybe you have to bring them in the lab and figure out how to like record brain activity while they're sleeping. And so, um, so do, there's a big difference between doing an experiment where you can bring somebody in and just set them down on a computer and an hour later like they go home with their course credit or their $15 or whatever, right? Um, and and then a, an experiment where you have to like have them sleeping and track them over time and so, like, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the postdoc a bit. Um, I want to ask you about that, but specifically through the lens of like, you know, I feel like the graduate school decision is often pretty straightforward for people. They apply to a bunch of places, they get some options, and, and that decision is usually pretty clear. The postdoc decision feels more complicated. It's, it's sometimes very strategic. You're looking to acquire a specific skill. Um, in your case, it seems like you were trying to, to gain the sort of access to the sleep stuff. Um, is that all there was going into that decision? Was that an easy decision? Or was it a yeah, good choice? It was, it was, it was uh, it was e an easy decision. The hard part was funding, as it often is for, mm -hmm. for postdocs. So, um, so in terms of my interest in going to Bob's lab, like I was very, I was very focused on going to his lab. I felt like he was like he was like the person who was doing this, like the kind of empirical sleep research that I wanted to be exposed to and, and um, learn about. And he was thinking about sleep in a way that I was interested in. So he was thinking about like. Um, how sleep impacts kind of like structured information or how you like selectively consolidate some things and not others and it just felt more interesting than some of the sleep labs that have been like here's your pairs of words do you remember them or do you not remember them or it just felt like his his um his kind of take on things felt more more interesting more like the direction I wanted to go um and there were very few people who had that combination of like the methodology and the kind of like the the like conceptual take on sleep that I was excited about. So I really targeted his lab, um, but he didn't have funding. He didn't have a funding line, so uh, so it was very stressful. Um, I like I applied. Let's see what happened. I applied for an NRSA, um, and it was like I needed to get it um, in order to go to his lab, and I didn't get it the first round, and then. And then some th some little grant came through, some enough like enough bridge funding for me for a year, and then I reapplied for the NRSA, and then luckily I got it. I actually don't even know what I would have done if I hadn't gotten it. Mm -hmm. um, so that I so like I got it, was able to stay on in his lab, but it was it was very stressful. Like get being able to go in the first place on like that little like not knowing if that little bit of bridge funding was going to come through, not knowing if the NRSA was going to come through. Um, so it was kind of a risky thing to do, but it worked out luckily. This is kind of an impossible question to answer, so you can defer. But like, obviously, a lot of people do confront that stress of yeah. the funding going into that next stage of their career, and some some uh, also face that stress um, in parts of graduate school. Not everyone has guaranteed funding throughout all of graduate school. Do you have any advice at all for for students confronting that situation? Again, it's a pretty impossible situation, but it's something that I think we all experience at some point. Yeah, in our career. yeah, it's like it's. I always feel bad when like when. I feel like my job now is to like make sure there's money for people so they don't like I don't want trainees to be like worrying about money. It feels like a bad thing to for trainees to worry about. But that's actually the reality of science, right? Like it's like you do need money for graduate students too, right? Not just for postdocs, but like graduate student lines, I mean it's different at different places, but you do need that their money for those like stipends comes from somewhere and um, even though stipend levels are too low, like it's still, it's still the money has to come from a grant or something. So, um, so yeah. So I guess it's like just part of academia to kind of be aware of of that. But um, yeah, what do you do? What do you do about the stress of not knowing whether things are going to come through and um, and what the possibilities are? Yeah, I I don't. 
I don't think there's, I don't think I have a good answer to that, except that like, they're, you know, have backup options or no, you like, think about other places. So in grad school, it's always good to go to a place where there's more than one person you're excited about. So if one person's line of funding doesn't work out, maybe somebody else's would. Um, I think it's, re I, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to choose a place to go to grad school where you're excited about more than one person because you never know for like, there's a lot of ways that one like individual relationship can go badly. And, um, and so, yeah, so it's good to have, it's good to have like other possibilities for grad school. For postdoc, it can be, it can be trickier to just like switch over to another lab. Um, but yeah, people do multiple postdocs. So if you, if you run out of money after a year or two years, like, yeah, you just apply for another postdoc or go on the job market or kind of move to the next thing. Um, so I think within grad school, it's more common to move to another lab within the same school, right? Um, and at the postdoc level, it's probably more common to just uh, kind of apply for uh, to a different place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you did a postdoc for a few years, and then you opened up a lab here at Penn in 2019. So you were here for a year, a little bit less than a year, before there was this thing that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was it like getting your lab started in general, but especially through the lens of this very difficult, unusual time, the pandemic? How did you manage yeah. all of that? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it was, um, it's like, it's funny because there's so many people in this room that were like the people that were there with me, right? So like, the, okay, so it was so fun to start up the lab and it was because like I was able to recruit these awesome people um, who were, were just like, you know, sitting down thinking about new ideas and it, just, it felt, I hope it was exciting for them, it was very exciting for me. Um, and being, yeah, being in the same physical space is definitely a part of that, like being up at the whiteboard and like thinking about ideas together. And so, um, so the pandemic definitely like what sucked, <laughs> like it definitely pulled like some of the energy out of that. But we had these like maybe too frequent Zoom interactions, <laughs> like sometimes twice a day <laughs> Zoom meetings at the beginning of the pandemic to like keep each other sane and like, like feel like there was some structure to our days. Um, and over time, I don't know, we sort of, yeah, like found different ways of, of interacting. I, I definitely felt like coming, coming back into this, back into the physical space together, like brought back some of that like new lab energy feel that I, that I loved at the beginning. So, um, so I don't know, maybe in a way it gives us an opportunity to like have an exciting like restart mm -hmm. to like be be back together but yeah yeah it was hard i mean luckily we mostly were able to pivot to like online things and modeling right um but um we did have we were trying to get a sleep study running so that was totally on hold the whole time and um and obviously we're right like we didn't start up our other like you know fmri data collection um but but I feel like we were lucky relative to other labs in the sense that we were able to do a lot of MTurk work and modeling work and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Made it through that way. One of the more unusual parts about the transition to being a faculty member is that you go from this state of being a trainee in some form for 10 years and then um, now you have all these trainees that you're responsible for. What was that? transition like for you from mentee to mentor? Was it easy? Was it natural? What were the, I'm assuming there's challenges associated with that. What were those challenges like for you and, and how did you address those? Yeah, okay, so, I mean, okay, wh one thing that like, I spent a lot of time stressing out about the job beforehand. I think I stressed out so much beforehand that it was like, easier once I actually started. Mm -hmm. I think it's just it's just my personality. So I was like very worried about like I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. Why are they why are they putting me in charge of this thing? Um and uh and like stressed out a lot in advance. And then but then once it was like happening all these wonderful people were here like you know to join the lab like it was um I don't know. It's just like it's fun and great and it what it's I spent too much time stressing out about it. So when people are like do, are doing are making the transition, I tell them it's fine. You just like yes, you haven't been trained to do this. 
but just like, stress just out as it. much as just possible yeah. leading up to your start. No, don't meeting stress out. And it'll, it'll um, I was going to say something else, but let's see. I mean, there, I feel like there's all kinds of things to learn. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. So a lot of people, I think, like kind of have a hard time detaching from the like the data analysis and the kind of you you spend so many years like in this certain mode of like data collection and analysis and like coding and stuff and then you like all of a sudden like completely switch over to this other mode where you're you're just managing I mean sometimes people continue with some data analysis and programming and stuff but most of it is a complete switch to a completely different kind of work where you're just doing meetings, basically, and writing grants, and that, and you know, editing papers, usually not like drafting papers. Um, but I think, I, so I wasn't sure I was gonna feel about that, and I think some people really mourn that like loss of the like implementing of things, but I found that I actually uh, was happier with the second mode. So I, I like the like thinking about ideas and talking about ideas and I was pretty happy to just like detach from the mm -hmm. the like day to day like um, analysis and stuff. I mean, so occasionally I like occasionally I miss it, but mostly I mostly I'm happier in this with this role, which is weird. It's like you don't know in advance necessarily what you're gonna want, and so it's a crazy thing mm -hmm. to like s you like try so hard to get these jobs, and then sometimes people are like, wait a minute. I just want, I want to do the data analysis, like, I, maybe I should go get a different kind of job, right? Um, and, yeah, I don't know if there's, like, a way to be, like, a trial. Well, yeah, you can do mentoring as a grad student and as a postdoc, right? And maybe that's, maybe that gives you a flavor of what, um, what the job, what the job is like. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's, like, if you like that, that's more what this is, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You have had a lot of mentors over the years in a variety of ways. Was there anyone who was particularly influential in sort of how you set up your lab, how you sort of model um, the way that you uh, work with your students and so on? Yeah, I, de I definitely model like most of what I do off of Ken. Um, so yeah, Ken, though like the kind of like weekly meetings as like the basic kind of like unit of like interaction and progress and um, like he's very good at email and I like I really appreciated that so I, I'm very like you know I, I'm responsive and I um, and um, like a, I'm a hands-on advisor I think which which he is and which I which I um, tr you know I've tried to emulate um, what other things yeah whenever I'm like in some new situation I'm like what we can do, yeah. What, what, what would like? What, uh, I, I I think he's a he's a really wonderful mentor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also want to ask you about challenges you've encountered. So obviously you started a lab right before a pandemic. That's a very challenging thing to do. I think people would agree. Um, but um, I think you know sometimes, especially young people looking up to their you know faculty advisors and so on, just like see these CVs with like all these accomplishments, and it just looks like everything was a win, you know, all yeah. the time. Um, to whatever extent you feel comfortable speaking about it, what sort of challenges have you encountered that um, that aren't aren't represented on your CV? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, you know, so I I applied for many grants. Like in the first several years, um, I spent quite a lot of my time applying for grants. And, you know, I get like three years of startup money for the lab and then like we got to bring in money after that. And, um, and we had a lot of, a lot of rejections. It was very hard. The hardest thing was that I, I put like, like everything I had into this R01 application. So R01 is like the big one. It's the one that like funds your lab for five years. It's, like you really like want that grant. And I put like my best, like my best ideas, like all of, like worked so, 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 so hard on that application. It was like the best I could possibly do, I thought. And I put it in and it did, it did worse than not discuss. So, you know, like, it's like, it's like the like top half of the grants are discussed, bottom half are not discussed. It got a score, but 
like they discussed it and then they decided it was like worse than like so it was like it it went like be below the not discussed like like uh -huh. drop off. Uh -huh. um, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. Like I I was I was like yeah. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if my lab knew how discouraged I was, but it was like it was horrible. I, I spent a day googling alternative careers. I was like, this is the end. This is the, like, this is like, like we can't. These were my best ideas. So if these aren't good, then we're done. Like, um, I, I recovered from that drama after a day. I just had to like wallow. But yeah. So so then so that was very very discouraging and i was like how many more grant applications like this is like this is ridiculous like it's it's so hard and i yeah i'm going to tell you a, a, a story that has happy ending but like it is hard like it is hard and this is a very hard thing about running a lab um and there's like always a that kind of time horizon of like when is the money going to run out and how are we going to pay for everybody's salaries and yeah um but i um i went to Ken, of course, who I should have gone to the first time, but I was like, okay, I got these horrible, horrible, horse, this like worst grant ever, the viewers hated it, like, can you just tell me, like, what can I do to improve it? And he was like, yeah, this grant, like, it needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, it needs a lot of work. So I, like, you know, like, got past the, like, emotional, like, trauma and, like, dug in and there was so much room for improvement. I don't know how to write grants. Like, there was so much room for improvement. So I, like, like took all of his advice. I really, I like really restructured it. I really took the reviewers' comments seriously, and and I like was like this completely new grant again. Spent so much time in it. I was like, okay, this is my best. <laughs> like the best, this is the best I can do. This is, a, this is definitely a way better grant. Um, and it got a first percentile score. Yeah, it's like absolutely like reviewers like loved it. It didn't have to go that way, right? I got like the first set of reviewers were like not. I think I got unlucky with that set, and I think I got lucky with the second set, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, like, but it was definitely a better grant. There was definitely room for improvement, and I definitely needed, like, there were skills I needed to, to learn for grant writing. So, um, so anyway, happy ending, but yeah, it was, it was a, yeah. It is, it is a funny thing about this career, just how many, like, slaps in the face there yeah. are like that. I think I, that, that is something that I greatly underestimated when I was embarking on this journey 10 years ago. Um, and it's it's also like in a I don't know I don't know if you feel this way but it's like almost like personal like someone insulting your ideas yeah you know is like the hardest thing you yeah. can take and I yeah. guess yeah all you can do is spend twenty four hours yeah. wallowing and then and then get up and yeah I th so I um so I'm I'm taking a I'm taking a mentoring class that Yael Nov teaches right now and mm -hmm. for that class we are reading this book called Thanks for the Feedback that I really really recommend it's like it's about how to receive feedback that's really challenging to, to hear and um, and I think that this is the kind of situation where it was like like you you take these things personally because it feels personal because I tried my best and I put my best ideas and these reviewers said it was bad and it just feels very personal um, but there was there was good feedback in there I mean not everything they said was was right and like not you know I don't I didn't take all of their advice but like you know, these are people who thought really carefully about it and like some, there's some stuff in there that's useful and like being able to find that or being, you know, being able to like go to a, a you know, a mentor and ask for like feedback and really hear it, constructive criticism on a grant, even though I had tried my best, right? There's still room for, for improvement. And um, so anyway, so that, so I, I really recommend that book and it's like, it's changed my, it's helped change my perspective on this like constant like barrage of um, of criticism that we get in academia and like what what can we take from it what can we learn from it yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and on a different note speaking of a different kind of challenge I know that you've recently successfully battled cancer um, which is very impressive um, I wonder if there's anything you'd want to say about that what that experience was like for you and especially um, what advice you might have for I mean, obviously, thousands of people experience this all the time. I mean, within academia, um, and it feels like something that people are scared to talk about, maybe in some way. Yeah. And, you know. So, do you have any thoughts about that, and 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 what you would say to someone who finds themselves in that, yeah. I imagine, very harrowing position? Yes. Um, lots, lots of thoughts. So. Um, yeah. So I okay. So 
for people who don't know, I um, in November I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it was like, it turned out to be just surgically treatable. So it turned out to be like really, really manageable, but which is amazing and I'm back and like I'm back to normal, but it was, but I didn't know that for a period of time. So it was, it was a very scary time of not knowing like what am I facing? How long am I gonna be out of the lab? Um, you know, like it seemed like the most likely course at one of the points was gonna be six months of chemo. And so I was like, okay, this is, you know, that's a big restructuring of my life um, to be thinking about. And, and just obviously just the fear of like how, what is the situation? How far has it spread? And yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously scary. Um, I really, um, I really benefited from um, connecting with other people in academia who were breast cancer survivors. So like I, you know, I connected one person who were like, uh, who connected me with another person. Like there were these three women I was talking to a lot in that initial period who were talking to me about like, just like the, the medical situation, right? Like they know the terminology, they know what it's like to kind of be able to read these papers on like cancer things, but not quite. And you know, like they, um, so they, like really could talk about that um, side of things, but also really helped me with thinking about um, how to, like, how to, how the, all the intersections with work things. So, um, like, I was, I was stressing about whether to tell people when to tell people, and they were like, just tell people, it's so much easier, just like, put it in your auto reply, just tell people, and I, like, I'm not shy, I, was, I didn't have any problem telling people, so I was like, okay, yeah, I think that'll be helpful, so I just did that, I told everybody, put it in my auto reply, it, like, I, that was definitely the right advice, like, then there was a million things like that about just, like, here's what you need to do, or just, like, you're, you know, sometimes you just have to step back and deal with your health, like, you can't, like, it's okay, like your lab's gonna be okay, like just, just you know, deal with your stuff. So, have, so having people in the field who could tell me, like remind me of these things and just like what, you know, how to, like, how to step through this and how to think about it um, was like really crucial. So, so what's my advice? Like find those people. Maybe it's me, maybe it's me. Um, if you are going through something similar to what I went through or, you know, like just, just find the, like, the right network of people to, to yeah. So, just I want to make sure I have the math right. So you were diagnosed in November. Yeah. And you were declared cancer-free in January. Um, yeah. So I, um, so I had a, I had a double mastectomy in um, December, and which was very fast. Uh, like I, I discovered I was very, very good at like manipulating the, the uh, healthcare system to, to like get you know st get all the the different tests I needed like quickly enough. And anyway, they were able to fit me in before the holidays for surgery, which was really good because otherwise I would have had to wait till January. And um, yeah, and then I had to wait for like pathology to come back to tell me like how, you know, did it, had it spread or not? We still, we didn't know like at that point. They were, they thought it had spread to lymph nodes, but they removed, they removed the nearby lymph nodes. And then it came back that it had not spread to lymph nodes and everything had been contained. And so it was just like, like, it was unexpectedly very, very, very good news. Like way better. It was the best possible scenario. Like it had not, they were confident it had not spread. They had removed everything in surgery and I decided to recover from that surgery. I then did a reconstruction surgery like a month and a half ago, um, which was much a much more minor surgery. And I'm like back to normal. I've been trying to go to spin classes. It's kicking my butt, but like, I'm, you know, so I'm not physically like fit, but I'm like able to try a spin class. So like, then, yeah. yeah. I feel like that's like some kind of record of like from diagnosis to recovery. That's just incredibly it, Yeah, it impressive. went, it went very, um, like it, it was resolved much more quickly and thoroughly than like the oncologist thought and that I thought, yeah, so I was very, very, very lucky. Yeah. Well, I think, I think I'll speak for everyone and just say that it's, it's really inspiring, not just how you handled all that, but the openness and, and sincerity of which you speak about that is really inspiring. So, so thank you for, for being willing to speak about yeah, that definitely. with us. Um, I just want to sort of close uh, by asking one sort of very general question, um, and, then, and then we'll open it up for you all to ask questions if you wish. But um, if you were to give one piece of advice to, like, let's say, your undergrad self who was just discovering the kind of models um, that she wanted to study, um, whether it's like, career advice or personal advice, what would that one piece of advice be? Yeah. I 
think so. I am the kind of person that always like. If you haven't picked up on this, like, I stress out a lot about the future, and I like want to like I I want to plan everything, and I want to like know how it's all gonna unfold, and I feel like. I, if I could go back to myself at any point in my life, probably including right now, I should give this to, so, myself this advice right now. Like, just like enjoy the thing that you're doing for its own sake, you know. And like, there will be there will be options down the line, you know. There will be things. And I think this is a big issue with academia because it's like there's always this like thing hanging over. Like, will I, you know, will I get the faculty position? Is it worth it? All the stuff that I'm doing. There's so few faculty positions, and um, and I think it's like. You know, I, I felt that stress, and and I think it at, like at every at every stage, there's always uncertainty about the next thing. But like, like you should be here doing this thing if you love doing this thing, and then it's like worth it because because you love it, right? Mm -hmm. And I have always loved it, so like, so I feel like I wish I wish I could just tell myself just like enjoy the thing that you love and don't stress about the future so much. Like I I mean that maybe it's like. Maybe it's obnoxious to say that from the point of like having the great faculty position, but like, I think like if it ha if this hadn't worked out and I was doing some other thing in some other you know in industry, like I could be loving that too, and I wouldn't have regretted doing this stuff beforehand because I loved it and it was fun. So, so if you don't love it, maybe you shouldn't. Do it. But if you love it, then do it and like don't don't stress out so much about the future. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we have um, just a few minutes if, if anyone has questions for. Um, Probably have a question. I I would reiterate what Sammy said. Like I really appreciated your honesty around your diagnosis. It feels like one of the great like sometimes it doesn't feel great living right now. But one of the things that's nice about living right now is like that there are all these taboos and things that were sort of not said before that are falling down. And I think it was the it was just really helpful that you were so open. You know I think I got your out of office message and I was like oh shh. you know like it was felt really bad. And then but it was also just really informed how to like move forward with talking to you yeah but you have other there's other parts of your sort of personal life like your you are your spouse is also on faculty and you had a baby during the pandemic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so um, what are what are some other things about sort of that have been like I guess challenges or rewards or things yeah. that are considerations being a woman in academia yeah yeah uh, that's like so many things. Yeah, it's crazy to have gotten that far in my whole story and not like say like, right, I met my partner in grad school, right? And then we had to like navigate all this stuff together and um, and then had a baby, which is like the most life-changing thing of anything, right? So it's, yeah, it's, thank you for bringing these things up. But it was also, yeah. we, it was so, it was like a secret baby because it happened during yes. the pandemic. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It's not, not a secret, but like, yeah. it must have been so unusual too that because you weren't out in the world, like it wasn't, yeah. it was like this thing that kind of happened that wasn't visible. I know, it was crazy. I was like, it was actually a really wonderful time to be pregnant in my view because I like, I was very sick in the first trimester and I was like, I was, I was vomiting like four times a day and I was just like on my Zoom meetings up, like gotta go, like and it was okay. Or I, if I didn't nap in the middle of the day, I could do that. So it's actually a nice time to be, um, to be pregnant. And I, yeah, I was teaching a hundred person lecture class on Zoom. They never ever knew I was pregnant. I was like very pregnant by the end and they never they, they never knew I was pregnant which is very strange um, and I was like giving talks you know all the way up until like through my third trimester all over the place nobody knew I was pregnant so yeah I, I, I enjoyed that as a way of like I had you know I had complete control over like whether whether I was gonna talk about whether I was pregnant or not and it wasn't like when you're when you're a super pregnant person you walk around in the world like that's just the obvious thing that you you know like and I, got, I had like a little more control over that than 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 is typical. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, having uh, I, I felt in a lot of ways like like that anxiety I described about like starting a lab. I felt the, a very similar way about having a kid, and I often thought about it similarly. Like the, these two like impossible to imagine things, and like not being not like not being able to like envision kind of doing it successfully but then you just sort of like are thrown into it and you just do it it's like a very similar feeling um but uh yeah that like it's very hard in very different ways but like the yeah the most amazing kind of uh like meaningful experience and yeah um what else can i say yeah 
it definitely like it, it for me having a kid I think forced me into a better work life balance than what I had before so I would fill I would fill nights and weekends all the time with work um, and and I and now I cannot do that and I think that's healthier for me so it's a, it's a way of like forcing me to have some balance that I think is is good for me uh, yeah we have time for one more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your R01, if like you felt like after you did all that editing on it, was it actually the ideas that were bad, or was it like, I mean, it's not, I mean, I feel like it's probably not the case that all the ideas were bad, but like, I guess, is it a lesson in like when you get bad feedback? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's like the like foundational idea. Yeah. It's like, Structuring. Yeah, it was um, it was it was really a grantsmanship thing. So um, the, the experiments really didn't change, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's good. So I guess thinking back, I should like yeah assign the credit like to uh, yeah. It it was it was not described clearly. It was not motivated clearly. Um, the the comments about the kind of content of the science were were addressable through like framing changes as opposed to changes in the actual like details of the experiments. But but they were like the you know, the reviewers were right that there there were like framing problems. I was assuming things that we that I shouldn't be assuming, instead we should be kind of evaluating and um, but yeah I think the main problem was the the clarity of the of the motivation and um, the kind of like logical flow of the different sections. It was more of grant, grant switch up, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I really appreciated um, what you said about the transition from grad student and postdoc to faculty member, where suddenly you're really dramatically switching kind of the content of the kind of work you're doing and um, maybe feeling a little unprepared um, based on the training you've had. That. And I also appreciate the book recommendation. I think we all could benefit from learning how to take feedback. Um, has that changed the way that you approach mentoring? Um, and I recognize you're still, sounds like, in the middle of this mentoring course. Um, so it's a two part question. One, has that changed the way you approach mentoring? And also, um, I should say, we're from Kirk, so, and I'm, um, I work, I do a lot of advising with undergrads who are looking to find research experiences and mentors. And what advice would you have for a student beyond kind of finding a research experience where the content of the research matches their interest, but how do you know if you've found like a good fit mentor? Yeah. Um, so is your, your first question is like how, like, how did the transition change the way that I thought about? Yeah, sorry, um, thinking about, or the book that you're yeah, reading, yeah. Um, how, how did that thinking change? about feedback. Yeah. How does that change the way that you yeah. provide feedback? Yes, to yes, that? yes, definitely. Um, so, um, so there's many, so, there, so one of the things that I really took away from the book is that there's different forms of feedback. Um, so there's like providing evaluations, there's uh, kind of, coaching and there's like providing kind of like appreciation um, and when people say they want feedback um, usually they have one of those things in mind and you and to give good feedback you have to figure out which of those things they're looking for um, and um, yeah I, I, I think that like when I was a student I mostly just wanted like appreciation <laughs> And so I kind of assume that that's what other people want. Um, I think everybody needs some amount of that. But um, but I think uh, I, I, I had an experience recently. This person is in the room. I won't out them. But this person uh, said was like like basically said to me like I'm look I'm like okay good I'm glad you appreciate me but like I'm looking for like feedback and I was like and and then and I didn't understand and then I read this book and I was like you want coaching like you want like specific things and I was like that's awesome like. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and then I was able to like provide you know what they were looking for. So, um, so I think like 
yeah, like thinking through like what what people are what people need and what they want and like um, and it is important and that book has helped me with that. Um, for undergrads looking for a mentor, I mean, I think that some people like some people care about mentoring and some people care less about mentoring. So I think it's good to find somebody who cares about mentoring. And I think that the best way to find somebody who cares is to ask people who are being mentored by that person. So, um, so just like, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was applying to grad school, I like I would just ask the like the current grad students the lab, like how how is it? What is it like to work with this person? And there's so many ways that it can be challenging to work with somebody. And sometimes grad students were just honest and they were like, this person is really challenging to work with for this 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 reason. Like, believe them. That is probably true. I mean, sometimes it's a fit thing, but. Sometimes, sometimes somebody is just like challenging to work with. So, uh, yeah, I think it's worth seeking out people who are who are being intentional about about mentoring and and who, where the people are are happy in, in the lab. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And if you could just um, join me in thanking uh, Anna one last time.